welcome everyone to Solidarity Speaks with the Green Olive Collective, All That's Left, Achvat Amim, and the Migrant, Immigrant, and Refugee Rights Alliance, an emergency webinar series giving people around the world a forum to hear directly from Palestinians and Israelis about the ways their communities are being impacted by the events of the last weeks, about the escalating violence they are experiencing, and about the urgent need for an immediate ceasefire and the end to collective punishment. My name is Erez Bleicher, and I'm the Communications and Membership Director of the Green Olive Collective, a binational advocacy information and tour guiding center committed to a democratic future and an end to the ongoing displacement of Palestinians. We provide communities around the world with insights into the apartheid policies of the occupation and the resources to engage in meaningful solidarity with Palestinians. We are joining together today and weekly through this emergency series as a global community of solidarity across checkpoints, barbed wire, closed military zones, and border walls. The occupation regime does all it can to fracture Palestinian society, to isolate them from each other and the world, and contain them in physical and imaginative cantons whose borders cannot be breached. We intend these weekly calls and gatherings as a breach of those borders and an expression of solidarity, empathy, and common cause against the limits of the dominant discourse set by Biden and Netanyahu. We are very glad to have with us today Ahmed Muna of the Educational Bookshop and Isildin Bukhari of Sacred Cuisine to hear about the ways Palestinian Jerusalemites and cultural workers are being impacted by the escalating violence of the last weeks since the war began an environment of severe repression, intimidation, and censure has taken hold in the Gaza Strip, as of course we know a lethal military campaign continues in Area C of the West Bank community space, imminent expulsion and settler militias, and Palestinian Jerusalemites who express any opposition to the assault in Gaza or the collective punishment they are facing face alarming surveillance, violence, and legal censure. Uh, Ahmed and Isaldin will speak with us about these developments and shed light on their implications for the present and the future. We're very grateful, honored, and glad they're here with us today. Um, Ahmed Muna is Joint Manager of the Educational Bookshop in East Jerusalem. Uh, it is a flagship institution in the city that since 1984 has functioned as a cultural, political, and literary center of Palestinian life. The bookshop presents a wide variety of Palestinian scholarly titles and frequently hosts workshops, lectures, and educational events. Isaldin is the founder of Sacred Cuisine. This unique platform is dedicated to the cultural preservation of Palestinian foodways, cuisine, and heritage. The project highlights the intersecting impact of climate catastrophe and unjust policies through food tours, catering, education, and interactive workshops. Um, thank you, Isaldin and Ahmed. Uh, for making time to be with us in this urgent moment. And um, I'll start, I think, with you, Ahmed, with the first question and allow you to introduce yourself more fully, more fully, and then move to you, Isaldin. Um, so to begin with, um, once again, thank you. And please begin by telling us more about yourself. What is your name? Where are you from? And where is your family from? What kinds of work do you do as a resident and justice advocate in your community? How does your work relate to your identity and commitment to justice? And what about your past has informed your relationship to the current moment and what's been happening these past weeks? You should be able to unmute yourself. Hello, everybody. Uh, I should say good afternoon. I'm assuming everybody has gone past 12 p.m. by now. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, thank you, Erez, and thank you all for being here. I'm, I'm looking at the participants 127. I actually think it is uh, amazing to see so many people who have taken time off whatever they're doing and want to come and, and listen, uh, you know, especially at this important time when we think the whole world is watching uh, uh, while, while whatever going on is going on in Gaza. It's actually really important and meaningful uh, to see so many of you here. So I really thank you all. Uh, my name is Ahmed. Uh, I'm 33 years old. I am born and raised in Jerusalem. I'm a Palestinian Jerusalemite. Uh, I work at the educational bookshop. Uh, as mentioned, it's a business that has existed since 19. 
84 by my grandfather and father uh, was started back then before even I was born. Uh, I joined, I, I grew up in this business. I went to study abroad. I studied finance and accounting in England. I came back in 2015. Uh, and since then, I've been part of the bookshop. We sell books that are related to Israel-Palestine in the big picture, but also uh, uh, the Middle East uh, and the peace process, the, you know, what I call actually from problem creation to problem solving and everything in between. Uh, we don't yet have the, the book that solved the problem, but, you know, we're, we're working on it. Uh, what we do in the bookshop is we... Uh, we we create this discourse. We create. I mean, it's a business first of all. Uh, so we sell books, uh, but also we have we sell books that are related to our region. But we also have uh, our uh, social responsibility or our responsibility to being a Palestinian bookshop that sells books in English and try to advocate a Palestinian uh, story through books. Uh, and that's what we uh, do when we can, we host events. These events are basically book, book, book readings, book events, uh, book launches for books that we sell. And the books that we sell are related to Israel-Palestine. The, the, the bookshop, I mean, maybe I've missed, I missed to tell you something. Uh, the bookshop started by selling Arabic books. We started to sell Arabic books in 1984 and stationary. We were not selling English books. Uh, very quickly, within maybe seven or eight years, we started to realize that uh, that there are no bookshops in Palestine or in Jerusalem that sell books that tell the Palestinian story. We used to get people in the bookshop 30 years ago and asking us about books on Palestine. And we, you know, we had them in Arabic, but we didn't have them in English. And the books that were available in English were books that were telling the, the Israeli perspective, the Israeli narrative. Nothing wrong with that, but there's only but there's also a Palestinian narrative uh, that we that people should should be exposed to, uh, and this is where we started to to import English books. We started to import English books, and we suddenly realized and quickly realized that we're the only bookshop that's doing this. And very quickly, we became the leading bookshop that sells books on Israel Palestine that promotes a Palestine. I mean, I'm I'm trying to link this to Eric's questions about you know the identity. Where what does what do you do? How do you advocate? How do you uh, where is the identity of you and the bookshop in all of this? And the identity is, I mean, is that the bookshop is today a leading bookstore that sells books on Israel-Palestine and it tries to promote a Palestinian perspective because we're Palestinians, because we have a story to be told. We have a story that we want the world to listen. It's a just and fair story and it, it exists in, in, in writings and more and more people need to do it. And this is why we do our book launches and book events so that we can make it accessible. We can invite people to come and listen to the authors to the uh, in these book launches to the to the narrative to the thoughts to the ideas uh, and uh, you know and hopefully this will be our tiny part in trying to shape a change uh, in our region i'm gonna stop here if you think i missed anything uh, i'm happy to go back to it but i also want to make sure as the dean answers his part thank you that's a wonderful beginning um, and i'm excited to hear more from you i know you have much more to share with us and more perspective to give um, when the bookshop does have the first copy of the book that solves all the problems, please let me know. I want to be the first on the wait list. Um, and I'm curious to hear more from you also about what it means for you to be someone who works in discourse. Uh, as I've known the bookshop, um, it's a gathering point for a community, a transnational community of thought, of perspective that tries to tease out what solidarity and connections across barriers can look like. Um, so I'm excited to return to that shortly. But first, I'll pass it to you, Izzeldin, and ask you similarly. Uh, well, first of all, of course, thank you again for being with us also. And if you could just begin by telling us about yourself. Um, what is your name? Where are you from? Where is your family from? What kinds of work do you do as a resident and justice advocate in your community? How does that work relate to your identity, sense of community, and commitment to justice? And what about your past? has been informing your relationship to this moment and what's been happening these past weeks. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, as the Dean Bukhari from the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, I come from uh, the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, my family immigrated from Bukhara, uh, which is in Uzbekistan right now, in 1616. So we've been in the old city 400 years in Jerusalem, old city. And uh, I grew up in a Sufi house, uh, in a, the family house. And uh, this is uh, by itself, it gave me a very unique perspective on uh, 
aspect on different aspect of life uh, growing up in a, in a Sufi house uh, it was, was something uh, unique uh, which helped me shape uh, who I am today and my business and such uh, but uh, I would say that uh, I'm 38 eight years old. As uh, most of you know, I'm a, I'm a chef and I cook Palestinian food. I have a company called Sacred Cuisine. Uh, but I would say my story started uh, when I left uh, the Jerusalem to move and live in the United States of America. That was like one of the biggest change happened in my life. I spent seven years in the United States of America. I lived in four different states. Uh, and then I decided to go back uh, to Jerusalem uh, for my family, for Sufism, and also for Palestine. But uh, what was interesting that uh, you, uh, like when I was living in the United States of America, I was, uh, I discovered my passion for cooking, basically. And this is, uh, it changed my career. Um, and uh, yeah, I started basically to experiment with cooking. And uh, I've been cooking, uh, working in different restaurants in the United States of America. Then I decided to come back here to Palestine. After I came back to Palestine, in a few years, I uh, established uh, Sacred Cuisine. And in Sacred Cuisine, I dedicate to tell the Palestinian food story, but in specific, the Somi food story, which is basically the vegan food uh, uh, in our cuisine and which is coming from the Lent, the Christian fasting. Uh, so honestly, uh, through my journey, I was able to discover some gems and some treasures in our history uh, as far as culinary. And this is what kind of uh, shaped sacred cuisine today. So uh, I was uh, Palestinian. Uh, I was shocked to see the amount of heritage and history there is in in dishes and how many dishes have a story and, and was a moment in my life when I learned about the falafel story that's it's really changed everything uh, what I do because when I found the story of falafel just to say it out quick because I know a lot of people will ask about it uh, the Coptic of Egypt created uh, the falafel and the Coptic of Egypt are the Christian of Egypt and they created the falafel as a food is suitable for the Lent for the Christian fasting so uh, that's like the story in the nutshell and uh, when I discovered the story I was so moved and even the falafel tastes different to me right now you know but uh, I decided to dedicate my time into looking into the history of food and why it is also because the falafel story you know it is something that's uh, over here in the country everybody fight also about the falafel you know and uh, when telling the story of the falafel you are just like moving the conversation from argument to facts i would say and this is basically became one of the dominant things I do is to document the Palestinian food, its history, culture. And I start to share it through food tours where I take people to see the heritage and the food in the old city of Jerusalem. And of course, to try it and to listen to the stories. Also through cooking classes where I show people how to cook uh, vegetarian, somi food, uh, vegan Palestinian dishes, traditional and also fusion. And also catering and such. And uh, I think, uh, to my surprise personally, I didn't really uh, think that Sacred Cuisine will have that huge in of impact uh, uh, on uh, on everybody encounter with Sacred Cuisine. But what I what I really found out that you know the food is is something that's bring uh, people together. You know, and in the same time, it's a very pleasant meteor. Uh, and uh, through it, I'm able to talk about the age and such, and uh, it is also something I would I would like to mention. You know, they always uh, sometimes ask me if it is possible to take the food, the politic out of the food, and I say absolutely no because <laughs> our life really make everything political, and even through the food, we can tell the story, uh, the Palestinian story. We can show how much injustice is happening on every 
level uh, from farmers to civilians to the land. Uh, so uh, it has became uh, something that uh, I'm passionate about is uh, to talk about my culture and to share it uh, with the world, with everyone. And uh, I really want to thank you all for making the time and to come and join and to hear about what's happening uh, uh, from our perspective. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, in this dark time, and it is one of the most dark time I ever experienced in my life. And I mean the country in general. It is very terrifying time. Uh, it is, uh, and I think this is even understatement. But uh, but we are here, you know, to share these stories, experiences, uh, whatever we have to share, in in a hope, uh, you know, to just wi widen the the narrative of the Palestinian story and get it out of the world because. The most thing I see clear in this war and what's happening, the amount and effort there is to silence the Palestinian. And it is a worldwide worldwide government uniting on to silence us, you know. And this is in the same time, it is make me feel hope, hopeless, but in the same time, it gives me a lot of hope that's all this effort and all this international community is trying their best. To silence us, and this has given me strength. That's uh, it is also not possible to silence the truth. So I'm happy to share with you more. But uh, now uh, I will pass the mic on. And uh, thank you again for being home. Uh, thank you for all being here, and thank you, Evis, for making this happen. And happy to be with Ahmed. Thank you, Azalim. I'm happy we can all be together, and happy that while it's true that authorities around the world are trying to silence Palestinian voices and voices of dissent against the violence being perpetrated. We can be here today as what is also worldwide efforts to speak about what's happening to end violence and collective punishment and do what we can. So we'll talk more about that also in a bit. Um, you said earlier that the impact of sacred cuisine um, you found is through the food as a medium and that's very true. You're an incredible cook and the cuisine speaks for itself of course, but I think also you as an emissary uh, of the food and of cultural tradition do incredible work. So I'm glad you're here with us. Um, and with that, I'll pass back to you, Ahmad, um, to bring things back specifically to these past weeks um, and what is occurring now and ask you to share what you can about what you've experienced and seen since the start of the war in your community how this moment is affecting your life, the life of your community and the work you do. Uh, and please tell us what the conditions are now and how people are being impacted so that everyone here who has gathered can bear witness and share with others around the world. Thank you, Iris. Oh. Uh, I'm also very happy to be with you, by the way, on this panel. Uh, if I can interrupt you for one second, sorry, I forgot to say, as we were getting into things, everyone should please feel free to send questions in the chat. Um, just write question before you send it at the start of your question, and I'll know to look for it and can work it back into the question and answer at the end. So thank you, Ahmed, for that. And sorry, sincerely, to cut you off. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I mean, life life has been tough. Uh, and Look, I, I was born and raised in Jerusalem. I grew up in Jerusalem. I left, you know, to study abroad, to work, whatever, and, and I came back. But I can say that the majority of the years that I have lived, I have lived in Jerusalem. And I can clearly say that life has not been more, have never been this tough. I've actually never been this this hard, this insecure. Don't get me wrong, it was not amazing before that. Uh, we've always had issues. We've always had police harassment. I'm not too sure how everybody, uh, you know, knows about East Jerusalem. But we are stuck in a place where East Jerusalem, from a Palestinian perspective, uh, is part of the West Bank. Is part is, is inhabited by Palestinians. From an Israeli perspective, Israel claims all of Jerusalem to be its own, both East and West. So it treats it as if it's uh, Israeli. But we're not really Israeli, and we're not really Palestinians in in that. Sense. We're Palestinians in our identity, in our heart. But we're not Palestinians in in terms of our passports and documentations and services. Uh, and we are not also Israelis uh, because we are not citizens and we don't feel Israelis. We don't feel that we belong to the state of Israel, but we're governed by the state of Israel. That means that setup puts us in a, puts us in a place where we are 
uh, under the Israeli ruling, but we're not Israel. So we're under an, a ruling uh, that wants to take the best of us and does not want to give us the basics uh, at the same time. Uh, this is why in Jerusalem, I, I mean, I, I had to go a step back to tell you that, you know, la, la, it, it's very terrible now, but it's, it's, it went from bad, it didn't go from good to bad, it went from bad to worse. Uh, because even then we had a lot of police and army in Palestinian neighborhoods in East Jerusalem. We will get stopped and harassed uh, by the Israeli army occasionally. Uh, we don't have the equal amount of services and post offices and infrastructure and so on and so forth in East Jerusalem. Now, when, you know, compared to West Jerusalem. Uh, when this happens, I mean, I, I'm somebody who drives a motorbike. Uh, a, a young man on a motorbike is a target for Israeli, uh, for the Israeli army. I was stopped four or five times uh, during the first week. So actually, it happened to me that I was stopped twice on the same day. Uh, just going, I mean, I live three kilometers away from my work, two miles. Uh, Going back to going to work, going back from work, you get stopped, you get uh, searched. Very aggressive. I mean, I'm I'm trying to describe what exactly happened the, the days as you know the seventh of October happened. Of course, we woke up uh, to shocking news, uh, and I, on that day I went to 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 work, uh, and you know thinking that you know it's just going to be a normal day, and of course streets were empty uh, schools have been called off uh, and for the coming two weeks for the next two weeks there were no schools uh, not even on zoom uh, the third week they started on zoom the fourth week some some kids started to go to schools depending you know where it is and in which zones and so on general uh, i mean from an economical business point of view almost dead i mean going from 100 percent to to 20 percent to 15 percent in terms of uh, of business all of the tourism was uh called off uh, all the tourists that were in the country were started to leave uh, within a few days they all left all the coming tours uh, that were coming to the city this is the holy land you know and we're coming into a busy season october november december are the high season so that was also uh, called off. The old city of Jerusalem survives on tourism. So that was all shut. Uh, and uh, we started to get also into strikes. I mean, of course, everything is closed. The post offices, the schools, people working from home, no people coming out. Because also, I mean, if you want to do something, it's either you want to go to an institution, it's either closed or you want to save yourself the hassle of going because most likely you're going to be stopped and searched in the street if you go from somewhere to another. Because, you know, within days, 300,000 Israeli army uh, were asked to come to, to serve. Uh, that's on the, for, the front of war. But also in the streets of Jerusalem, you can see the increase, increased number of, uh, of brutality. Uh, and that's when you start also to see uh, not on TV, not only what's over is going in, on Gaza in terms of bombing and massacres and airstrikes, but you start to also see uh, escalations happening in the West Bank. Uh, and that affects us because we in East Jerusalem are also part of the West Bank. Uh, whether we like it or not, whether it's physically connected or not, uh, there's a wall around Jerusalem disconnected from the West Bank. That is correct. But there's also many people who go to the West Bank every day and that come from the West Bank every day. Many Palestinian students go to Birzeit and Bethlehem University, which is in the West Bank. So they cross a checkpoint every day. The checkpoint between Ramallah, the main checkpoint between Ramallah and Jerusalem, Beit Bahim and Jerusalem, were also closed. It's like we came to a standstill. And there were also some strikes. So on the third day, there was a strike. On the fifth day, there was a strike. A strike then also, the 20% of life that you still can manage to do is also stopped. Uh, on, on days that you, I mean, I'm, I'm saying all of this and I don't want you to get the impression that we were just trying to get on with our daily life. I think this is starting to become the uh, reality today, five, six weeks into this. We, people, I can feel uh, for the last week in the streets of Jerusalem, you know, I go to the bookshop every day almost. So I, I go to the city center every day. So I, uh, you know, I drive on the roads. I see people, I see shops opening, institutions. I, I, I see kids going to school. So I observe all of this. And in the last week, I'm starting to see that there are more people trying to get to their normal life just a little bit. Uh, I mean, nothing, nothing amazing, but I can see that, you know, things have started to get normal. But, but I really don't want to say this at the same time. I already said it, but I also don't want to say it because, because I mean, it's not normal. It is still not normal. Six weeks into this, I can understand that people uh, want to get into their lives. They want to move on. They want to, whoever wants to have a degree, they want to finish their degree. Whoever had a project, they want to do their project. Whoever needs to send things in the post office, they want to go and send things from the post office. Uh, 
Uh, but but I can't really tell you that life has gone to normal. The tension is still uh, there. I've seen people, youth in Salah Adin Street, where the bookshop is being beaten up for, for no reason, being uh, stopped. I've seen two demonstrations happening in Salah Adin Street where the Israeli army came to peaceful protesters and threw uh, grenades and uh, sound grenades and stun grenades uh, at them uh, when we've then forcing, forcing everybody to close uh, the streets. I am still being stopped on my motorbike, not as often, but, you know, just outside my neighborhood, there is a checkpoint. And, you know, as you drive for two minutes and here at the entrance of the checkpoint, at the entrance of the neighborhood, you have to get stopped uh, on a checkpoint. I attended an event a couple of weeks ago where Azidin was there, actually, uh, in the old city. And the moment we left that uh, event together, uh, you know, I opened the door to, to the place that we were in. And uh, it was an exhibition. And just as we left, there's like 40 armed uh, soldiers just in the middle of the Muslim quarter in the old city. I, I mean, I don't know what the heck they are doing. It's, it's just scary. You know, you leave this place and you, suddenly you see 40 armed, heavily armed uh, soldiers. You, you just don't know what to do. You know, you don't want to do anything. And you, you don't want to continue because you're afraid they're going to harass you. But you don't want to go back in because they're going to follow you. I mean, you just don't know what to do. And the orders that you feel that the orders, my God, <laughs> I went on. But look, I I, I feel it, it, there's also, finally, there's also a feeling that the, the there are orders to, to shoot. There are orders that all Palestinians, you feel that you are a, you're being treated as a terrorist. You feel that you are a target, that you feel that you are not, there's no chance to make a mistake. There's no chance to just make a tiny mistake. Two nights ago, my cousin was uh, visiting me here and he was coming back. Uh, he lives nearby here in the same neighborhood and he was coming back and he told me he was stopped at, stopped at the checkpoint at night coming back to the neighborhood. The army asked him, uh, just out of the blue, he's 17 years old. And they, they were like, do you support Hamas? I mean, g g three armed soldiers stopping at 17 years old, asking him out of the blue, do you support Hamas? Of course, he said, no, I don't support Hamas. I support peace. And they, then they asked him, uh, do you have a girlfriend? I mean, they didn't ask for his ID. They didn't ask for anything. And he, he thought that they just want to get to his phone because this is something else that the Israeli army has been doing, is taking people's phone, go, going on their, uh, you know, messages and WhatsApps and so on and see, you know, what kind of information they send, what videos do they watch. Uh, because there's also a censorship uh, that has been taking place about basically silencing, silencing the Palestinians, let alone that you're not allowed... Uh, not allowed. You 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 don't have that that chance to even express or protest or say anything or express your your sadness even about what's happening. Uh, but even if you're watching something that is really, I, I know men who have been beaten up because they have uh, backgrounds on their you know they have photos on their phone uh, that that the Israeli army will call that supporting violence, quote unquote. So it's been tough. It's kind of life is starting to become normal, but it never will be normal when we are opening the news every day and we see uh, hundreds of children being killed. It can't be normal. I'm going to stop here. Thanks, Alan. And sorry to cut you off, Isolene, if you are to, about to begin. I just wanted, before passing to you, Isolene, I saw, firstly, thank you for describing what you're seeing around you, what the mood is. The level of violence that exists and also i think it's important to point out the level of impunity that soldiers army police feel they can get away with anything in this environment and um, somebody asked in the chat what the strikes were about and i was wondering if you could give two words of context uh, so the strikes the strikes were the first one was uh, when the hospital, the Mahmadani hospital, on the fourth day of the war was uh, bombed, uh, and uh, I don't know, 300, 400 people were killed on that uh, bombardment. Uh, that night, uh, the Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, was supposed to meet Blinken in Jordan. Uh, was it Blinken or Biden? Sorry, Biden. Biden in Jordan. And uh, he called off his, when that bombing happened, he called the, the meeting off. He came back to uh, to Ramallah, to, to, to Palestine, and he uh, declared three days of strike because of the 
because of the targeting of the hospital uh, and the tra- strike is basically a strike of of i mean it, it, it when when something sad when something bad happens it's a it's a morning i i should say we call it a strike in arabic but it's more like a morning uh, so you're mourning the dead the innocent uh, people who were killed so that was one another one was uh, when two palestinians from jerusalem uh, were uh, were killed uh, in the neighborhood of uh, Mount of Olives. The a third one was, uh, I'm trying to remember, uh, the 14 people, basically, when, uh, I can't remember I, uh, when it was, but it was uh, an, inv- an Israeli operation invasion that went into Jenin three weeks into the war. Uh, and that was uh, another, uh, basically, a day of mourning. That's when the Palestinian Authority basically declares that the next day, because of a certain event that happened, is a day of mourning. It does not make a lot of sense to me, to be honest with you. I was just describing it to you, but, you know, there are deaths every day. So if you were going to mourn people, then we should close every day. Uh, but we don't. Uh, and, and and it's really not fair that we close when some people die, but we don't close when other people uh, die. Whether we close... Uh, so, you know, I don't think... I really am skeptical about you know the point of these strikes and mornings, but but this is what happens. I'm describing to you uh, what happens, and I'm not sure how effective they are because when I close, I hurt myself. I'm, I'm my my I'm, I'm not you know the idea was in in the past that these strikes were used to hurt the Israeli system. So if you're a Palestinian working in the state of Israel and then you 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 strike, then on that day you have hurt the economy. Uh, but clearly that doesn't matter when the U.S. is giving 14 billion. Uh, uh, dollars to, to, to Israel. I mean, it doesn't really matter if I close or open, because even the business, or if an Israeli, a Palestinian worker goes to work in Israel or not, I mean, it doesn't really matter, but it's not going to affect the economy, in my opinion, at least. Uh, so, you know, I, I wonder what is the point of them. And nonetheless, we do them anyway. If you don't do it, then you will be called a traitor also. So it's it's quite, uh, it's, it's interesting. But yeah, this is what the strikes are about. Thank you for giving more context. and. Hard. The question for all of us in this moment is how we mourn and hold the collective anguish. It's impossible to hold all of the anguish and grief in one instant or in one action. And what this moment means on that front, and as an ongoing emergency that just continues, is difficult to grapple with. Um, and, but anyway, thank you for giving context and shedding light. Isolde, and I want to turn to you, of course, and ask you the same. Um, and if you could speak to what you've seen and experienced these past weeks since the start of the war. How's this moment affecting you, your life, the life of your community, the work you do? Uh, what are the conditions around you and how are people being impacted so that people gathered here can know and share with others? Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, I will start uh, by continue, by talking about that moment when Ahmadi was talking uh, about uh, that we met in the old city of Jerusalem. It's actually where's the Austrian hospice. So it is like on Via de la Rosa and the area is always heavily armed with the Israeli soldier and they stop uh, many Palestinian. Uh, but since this has happened, uh, you know, since, uh, 7th uh, October, uh, this is even became like 200 times more and more aggressive and uh, you could see and feel how it is a revenge vibe you know so it is like they are just waiting for any reason or anything just to to like beat you up or take you to jail so it became very scary and uh to be honest that's even walking especially when you're walking uh, uh close to soldiers and stuff as ahmed say you cannot even <laughs> make a mistake because you can be shot for uh, whatever it is so it is like uh even just walking, it has became more different, more conscious. But uh, actually, Ahmad, he was talking about the story when we left. But when I came to the Austrian hospice, uh, it was, uh, you know, after the sunset. And at that time, I don't go after the sunset. So I was like already feeling like uh, it's it's dangerous and such. And I'm walking to on the Via de la Rosa toward the, the Austrian hospice. And on the intersection, I already can see there was like five soldiers holding their machine gun on a, on a Palestinian and they are like asking him to move slowly and stuff. And I'm like going down the street. I'm going toward them, you know. So right now I'm like thinking, should I go back home? But I was like, uh, maybe if I go back home, uh, I will be suspicious or such. And I'm just like walking slowly, hoping nothing happened, you know. And then I go to the Austrian hospice. <clears throat> 
And also, as we left, we are like looking, and there's, as Ahmed said, 50 soldiers around, and it's it's terrifying. You know, it's scary. And uh, that level of uh, civilians, uh, that level of uh, search, uh, checking ID, uh, it's on another level. I mean, you know, I was born and raised in the old city of Jerusalem. And even though the old city of Jerusalem is part of Jerusalem, it is somehow the old city of Jerusalem itself. It's like a different dimension. It is more secure, more tight, more there is door to, to the old city. So each door is controlled. Uh, and there is more Israeli police presence and uh, it is more aggressive and such. So... Uh, I lost my point, actually. <laughs> uh, but uh, basically, um, like, the soldier do whatever they want. If they don't want you to come to the old city, they're like, you're not allowed to go in, you know. And uh, the old city become its own uh, word. Uh, and even in Corona, I go around and walk around the old city, and it is uh, quiet. But now it is even more. Like most of the shops are closed. Uh, people, of course, tourist is the main thing you see. And uh, yeah, it's it's it feel like to be honest, it feel like Judgment Day. I've been like feeling like I'm in a Judgment Day the last month, you know. It's so sad. It's devastating. Uh, we are so worried about our families in Gaza, and it is. Uh, and there is nothing to distract your mind. There is no work, at least for me. There is like zero work. So I'm still working. I'm still doing office work uh, in for my company and such. But it is. Uh, it is so hard to distract your mind, and all what you see is the news, and the news have more devastating news. It's like we didn't even have time to process. We didn't process anything, and there was like even more. But uh, it is uh, the most terrifying moments of my life, the most worry, and, uh, you know, uh, for just for contents, my family, uh, my sister is live in Gaza, and uh, my uncles, uh, they are in Gaza, my aunts uh, are in Gaza, and uh, we already lost the aunt, one aunt of mine, my sister mother, her and her family and her husband family, 31 member were killed in one airstrike, you know, and this is, was in the beginning uh, of the war. And uh, all of the rest of our family now is on the south. And we, the mission of the day is to reach them and to talk to them and to hear they are okay. That's what mission of our day. Sometimes we are able to succeed to do it in the morning. Sometimes we don't have connection. Like today, I talked to them just before I started to Zoom. I like uh, I was talking to my sister. I was trying to even help her with the eSIM, which is something we couldn't manage to do. But uh, I mean... Uh, it is very concerning time, and I I say this as a worldwide. It is not just about Israel and Palestine. This time in specific, it's it's have so much effect as a worldwide point of view. And as as I see it right now, it's uh, it's about uh, voice of uh, there is like two voices. Of course, we can break them down to different category, but there is a a voice who want to argue about everything and just bring things and there is a voice who trying to make a sense out of it and just say like please cease fire at least there's like the children dying by thousands you know and uh, uh you know it is very emotional i can go on and on and on there is so much uh, to say but uh yeah i never experienced uh, this time and i cannot wait for this is to finish i somehow still believe that this is a nightmare i'm gonna wake up next day and forget about all of this and uh yeah thanks Hazel. um there are different messages of condolences also in the chat um for you and your family and our thoughts are with you and with so many other people who are experiencing loss right now um i guess this wasn't one of the this wasn't something i planned to ask on the webinar, but from the things both of you are saying, it seems like this moment is very different than any other moment you've experienced. And I guess I'm curious about that. Ahmad, you said that it's more difficult than any other moment you can remember. Isaline, you even used the metaphor of judgment day. I guess I'm curious um, because of course, as you've pointed out, um, occupation and ongoing Nakba and policies of injustice 
have been ongoing for years and years um, in your own lifetimes. Um, living where you do, you've lived through 2014, another moment around Gaza and Israel-Palestine through what's sometimes referred to as the Unity Intifada in 2021. Um, I guess I, I wanted to ask you, because it came out so powerfully in what you both said, what feels different to you about this moment? Um, or, yeah, just what makes it distinct? Uh, Ahmed, do you want to... Uh, offer any thoughts, and if not, also that's fine. No, no, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Uh, it's, it's. I don't know how to describe. It. It's something that you feel. Uh, but look, from the first day, from the first day, the this operation, this I don't know what's the right word for it. But look, for first of all, a war is not the right word for, for what's happening. This is not a war. Uh, when when you have one side dropping bombs from from the sky and and uh, and children being killed on the other side, that's that's not a war. But you know, now call it op an operation, call it whatever you want. But we're gonna use the word war because this is what everybody is calling it. But but it's not a war. So from the day from day one, the war was declared in 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 the country, uh, which meant that the country went into a a war mode, in an emergency mode. Uh, this emergency mode means that many things within the uh, the, the country that is Israel uh, happen in a different way. Uh, the army has out of a sudden has more power. The police have more power. They can uh, arrest people uh, more easily. They can uh, suppress. They can cancel things. They can stop things. They can question you, stop you, arrest you uh, for for anything. They don't have to, you know. So, so that's one. But let me just put them in order. This is, or try to make put them in a structure. This is uh, one thing. The other thing is there has been, uh, there has been uh, uh, this. I from previous wars. Look, this is not the first war on Gaza. There, there wasn't uh, air strikes and operations happening in two thousand nine, in two thousand twelve, in two thousand fourteen, in twenty twenty one. Normally, I mean, this really feels bad now to say, but normally we'd know this is going to start. It's going to last. 20 days, 30 days, 15 days, 16 days, 21 days, whatever days, you know, 40 days, 50 days, and it's going to stop. In all these previous times, a war was not declared. They were not in a status of war. This time, the country is in a status of war, which means, you know, emergency, everything is an emergency. Everything is emergency. You know, the 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 this more strict and from one side that, you know, you're, you're being uh, punished more strictly or more loosely. Uh, the action to to punish you is more loose, but you're being punished more strictly. If that makes sense, uh, so so that's an, uh, another thing that the status uh, that it had put us in, and and most importantly, not not even about the daily life. Normally, you know, if this was 2021, I can see the end of the tunnel. I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. This time, I don't see the light at this uh, at the end of this tunnel. I don't see it, and this is why I think it's different. I I just don't know how this is going to end, and nobody knows how this is going to end. Uh, and you know, we hear Blinken say something uh, last night, and then the the next morning, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu says something exactly the opposite. I mean, and and then you hear Israeli news, and it's all lies. And then you hear the, the 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 Palestinian news coming from Gaza, and you don't know if you should believe it or not. And then you see videos of uh, that are being artificially, uh, you know, modified with artificial intelligence and photos, and you don't know what to believe anymore. Uh, and you see somebody telling you, you know, we killed you know 140 people. Somebody else told you, oh, we didn't even, you know, we didn't we didn't even lose two people. I mean, it feels like we're living in a sci-fi, you know movie that has many series and i just wanted to stop i can't watch it anymore like yesterday i said that's it i'm not going to watch the tv every night i come on on at home and i open the tv and i'm there observing for two three four hours news 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 and yesterday i wanted to take a break from it because i just can't take it anymore and it, as i said what's different i think mostly what's different is i can't see the light at the end of the tunnel it does not seem to be there it just we don't know how this is going to end and and it's not going to end like every other war. And I think the brutality that we're seeing in the street, the aggressiveness of the army, uh, it's 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 unprecedented. It has never been this bad. The the limitations to freedom of movement, the limitations of freedom of speech, people being arrested for putting a like on on Facebook status. I mean, th this is how much 
the censorship is. This is how bad it has gone. This is where like you're just afraid to say something. You're you're afraid to say good morning to your wife for God's sake, because you don't know if this is going to carry a, a message with it in, in in a way or not. Uh, you know, because you also don't want somebody. This is why it's different. And I, I don't know if you get the message or not, if you get the atmosphere or not. And I actually, if you allow me, there's just one last thing. Because I saw in these in these questions coming up, uh, something about, uh, you know, set, settlers. Settlers being, somebody asked a question about, you know, how settlers are. Yes, uh, how are settler presence and behavior change in East Jerusalem over the past month? It's gone from like miserable to like below ground miserable, like to to shit to 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 to. to. What also changed this time is I can see revenge. Like 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 I can see Israelis and especially settlers. They want to take revenge from anybody that affiliates with Palestine. You don't even have to be a Palestinian. If you carry a Palestinian flag and you're British, then they want to take revenge from you. They're calling people who are calling for ceasefire. Uh, terrorists. They're calling them anti-Semite for for calling for a ceasefire. I mean, the the the, the pushing of 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 the, 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 the what do you call it the the censorship and the suppression of of freedom of uh, of speech has gone so far that it's it's different than any time. And and I can't see how we're gonna come out of this. I don't. I can't imagine the day when the war ends. The war has to end, and it will end. Uh, it has to end. But I don't know how it's going to be after, because after the war, it's going to be never like it was before. It will never be the same. Uh, I can see revenge in in in. Look on 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 one week after the uh, the war started, uh, I met a journalist who have been in in the West Bank, and he told me, he interviewed many people in the West Bank, and he told me some of the Bedouin communities that live in Area C in the West Bank, four hundred and fifty. This is only after one week. Four hundred and fifty Palestinians who live in Bedouin. Uh, villages around the West Bank were attacked by Israeli settlers, not army settler who is that are armed by M16s, you, you, wearing uh, an Israeli army uniform, and basically stripping the men of these villages naked, beating them up in front of their families, and telling them, "If we're gonna see you, if we're gonna come back after one hour, if we see you here, we're going to shoot you." These families had to leave their uh, their ten- they, they don't even have houses. They live in tents. They're Bedouins. They live in tents. They don't even have cars. They have, you know, camels and, and cattle and so on. And they had to leave everything behind and run for their lives. Uh, 450 of them. This only happened one week after. There has been many, many, many of them. Take, because all the army have left to, to fight in this war, they armed the settlers that are in the West Bank illegally in Israeli settlements and outposts. And now these settlers are wearing uniforms of army and having M16s as is kicking Palestinians out. This is how beautiful the settler scene is now in the best in the west bank i'm being sarcastic by using the word beautiful in the west bank and in uh, in in east jerusalem it's it's it, it's scary it's scary yeah it's very vicious and difficult to see and I'm, I'm only interjecting for the sake of time um to cut you off there's so much important that you're saying um and that's right the distinction between settler and soldier in area c uh, and other contexts has almost collapsed um, in this moment. We heard some people from Masat Yatta and the South Hebron Hills this last Wednesday speak to that. Um, and in terms of the level of collective punishment, the level of violence, the level of impunity, the amount of restriction on movement uh, and economy, I think you drew out some really important points that are so difficult for all of us uh, who have not experienced it to grasp. Um, and even this last week, I, I was with you in the bookshop, uh, and you, as you often do, were pulling different books off the shelf that you were recommending and giving to me. And I, there was one about Gaza, I flipped to the back. And just in the blurb on the back of the book, it described the length of time and the number of casualties in 2014 in Gaza. Um, and I was shocked because I, I'm not remembering the exact numbers in this moment, but it was so much smaller and more limited than what we're seeing now, the amount of um, lethal power that's been um, unleashed. It's devastating. It was around 10,000 and now it took about 11,000. Sorry to take so much time, I'm gonna stop. No, no, I'm sorry to have to interrupt. I just wanna make sure that Isolde, um, if you have thoughts and you want to share, we would love to hear from you also about what feels different um, to you about this moment than any other. Um, and you can take that in any direction you want. 
I would say uh, the thing I will add that uh, what's happening in Palestine, uh, it is did not change. You know, uh, it's been happening since '48, and this is how the word is disgusting because they don't look at what's happening to Palestine from point. They just look at it from 7th of October, just deleting everything happened. But uh, what happened in Palestine, you know, from 2014, Nakba, you know, 67, 48. Uh, it's been happening since 48, you know, nothing new, but it's now it is happening on a massive scale. You know, the ethnic cleansing is happening on, on a scale, you know, it's not just happening here and there. It is like, like imagine in one month, there is at least 11,000 people dead, you know, 3,000, 4,000 of them are children, you know, and, uh, so that's what is alarming. That's what is uh, it's like. It's very clear to see, not just here, you know, like we all already know it. And as a Palestinian, we know it, but also for the international community and for the worldwide uh, political vo uh, point of view. You know, I'm not talking about the people because the people are doing differently. We see demonstration. We see their solidarity all over the world, you know, but as far as government, you know, you know the time that's uh, we seeing like ah oh, we don't care about your life end of point ah oh, you want to tell us about your children but what about uh, like Hamas wait do, do you condemn them are you Hamas or are you not and that's the conversation and that's how uh, uh, of course you know just like for everyone who does not have a clear point of view of course it is not a lot it is not accepted to be violence against civilian no matter who you are it does not matter which country you believe you know this is not acceptable but if you want to talk about this let's talk about the conversation of the from the beginning of it if you want to talk about this so talk about this subject you know but uh yeah just like uh that's what is, is happening it's like this ethnic cleansing is happening on a massive scale uh all of this happening worldwide people seeing it and nobody can do anything about it and you know uh and you know like i personally in the last i mean since the beginning of the war i'm trying my best but the last few days i'm doing extensive effort connecting every diplomatic uh contact uh people my family network uh, uh people vib you know trying to get someone to help us to get my sister out you know and most of the people they are really dedicated and they want to help you know and they have position which is up high and they are telling me like we cannot do anything you know and i felt so hopeless and like that moment to feel that hopeless that's not just about my sister, all these children who are dying in, in Gaza. And just like, I cannot even for one minute, I challenge all of you who is on this call today to go and watch a video of one minute sounds of bombs that's happening in Gaza. Go and finish with this one minute. And I couldn't finish it. Even when I talk to my sister, I hear bombs and, and things. But it is like, uh, so like we are reaching that level, you know, and uh, that level is beyond alarming. I mean, this is how the Holocaust happened. This is how many uh, genocide start when it is becoming a norm to go this massive scale. So my question and my alarm and my fear is coming from the future. If this is happening now, what could happen again? And yeah, I agree to Ahmad and uh, all of us. We know like the word will not be the same after uh, this war and it will stop but it will not it will not be the same thanks Azaldin. um there are many 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 things that you said that i think are important to highlight and I, I don't have time to do them all justice um but i think the way you described how easy and uh, and inevitable it is for all of us who care to feel powerless in different ways as we try to shift the trajectory of things is very poignant and pertinent. Um, I think that, um, oh, I also lost my train of thought thinking about the different things. Um, but I guess um, I wanna say that it's not taken for granted by me uh, or I hope by anyone here that you two are here sharing these stories uh, speaking to us, creating solidarities and conversations across contexts and across borders and limits of imagination that large world powers and discourses are trying to shut down. 
Um, and on that note, I wanted to shift to a last question before I turn to questions from participants. Um, I guess I wanted to ask you both exactly about that. Um, what do you see as the role of international solidarity in this moment or local solidarity in this moment? What does solidarity mean in a global context right now as events unfold in Gaza, Jerusalem, the West Bank and beyond? And why is it important to sustain solidarity in this urgent moment? What kinds of solidarity um, do you think are important to maintain? Or do you think it's important for people around the world to express? Um, would love to hear your thoughts in any direction. Um, Ahmed, do you want to share any first thoughts? Uh, this is actually a great question uh, that, that is also great for audiences approach. Uh, I, you know, as the Dean said something, and I was planning to also say this. It, it, it this time it feels like when the when I was watching the news in the first week uh, that you know everything was peaceful in Israel Palestine. There was no problem. There was nothing. You know, two nations were living peacefully with each other, lots of harmony. And just out of a sudden, on the seventh of October, you know, something crazy happened. It's crazy, yes. What happened was crazy, but it's it's not it's not like the war started on the seventh of October. It's not like we were living in harmony on the seventh of October. And I think there's a lot of misinformation and misconception about, uh, you know, the seventh, especially you know people who support uh, or are you know support one side or the other or who uh, you know sympathize with one side or the other. People who are know about this conflict, who people who study this conflict, no know that this event of October is not the beginning of this conflict. Uh, but people who don't, and people who just started to see it, and I think that's a big chunk of people today. Today, there, you know, I, we open the TV and I see 500,000 people in London. I see 100,000 people in Paris protesting. These are the people who went to protest. That also means there are people behind the screen who have sympathy, but they didn't want to, to go outside in the street. So there is this conflict of Israel-Palestine is grabbing a lot of attention from the whole world at the moment, today, for the last month. But I've, I'm scared, I'm, I, I fear that a lot of this attention is only coming after the 7th of October. Now, this is good and bad at the same time. It's good because that means that we need more people to be aware of this, because, because I believe the change is going to come, that's me personally, I believe that the change is coming from the outside, not from the inside. But that's also scary because the message that I'm seeing in the first week of this war is that, you know, everything was peaceful and nice and harmony and, 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 and beautiful. But on the 7th of October, it broke up. 7th of October is one event among many, many events that have been happening since 1948. Uh, if the Palestinians and the Israelis were going to solve this conflict for themselves, we, they would have done it by now. So I think the 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 weight of solving this conflict is is coming from abroad, and 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 this is so cynical of me, uh, because you know we Palestinians and Israelis should be the one responsible for solving our problem, right? But look, we are not able to solve it. We clearly are not able to solve it. We maybe want to solve it. Maybe we are uh, we we fantasize about solving it, but we are uh, and maybe we are serious even about solving it, but we don't have the means to solve. It. You look at this at the conflict over the last 75 years, and you see it now in the first month, after 11,000 people are, are killed in Gaza, uh, for millions of people asking for ceasefire, or either on social media or on the streets or in, on TV or in interviews, intellectuals, authors, uh, celebrities, asking for the uh, ceasefire to happen. I mean, we're only asking for a ceasefire, for God's sake. I mean, we're not asking for something big. I mean, it's so like, you somebody's shooting, you just tell them, stop shooting. It's so simple. And the whole world, after 35 years, is unable to force the state of Israel, a bunch of... Uh, you know, choose whatever word you want, uh, sitting in a cabinet, the 12 of them, uh, unable to stop them from just calling a ceasefire. I mean, this is how, this is how bad it is. <laughs> this is how bad it is. 12 people are sitting in a room just need to say, to agree on a ceasefire and they're not agreeing. And the whole world, the millions of people are not able to, to do this. They're not able to force Israel to come to a ceasefire. This is the image of the conflict for the last 48 years. If the state of Israel had accepted the terms of Oslo, we would have had an Oslo agreement. If the state of Israel had accepted whatever and whatever and whatever would have been solved now. We need to come to a point where we need to be forced into the solution. I mean, coming from a Palestinian, 
I don't, I don't know. I mean, surely the Palestinian leadership have probably made mistakes, have not, uh, you know, did, you know, things that they must have done at some points. Uh, but, but, and they need to, they need to be forced into a solution. Uh, and clearly the people of Palestine are not able to force their leadership. And the people of Israel, if I want to assume goodwill and that they really want peace, although I'm not too sure all of them want it, but anyway, even if they do, they're not able to put their leadership into uh, into a position to accept peace, to work for peace. We, 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 we both of us are uh, in a place where we're managing our leaderships to go into war, but we're not managing our leadership to go into peace. And clearly, we're not going to be able to do it after 75 years. So this is where the role of international community needs, needs to be in. I thank everybody who protests. I thank everybody who calls calling for a ceasefire. You're doing a great job if you're doing so. But I'm sorry to tell you, it's not enough. We need to do more. First of all, we need to make a ceasefire. Second of all, we need to come to terms to make an agreement and to make peace once for all. For all. And because if we don't do it this time over, it's going to blast again. It's going to be a matter of time. Another, you know, this war will end another three, four years to rebuild Gaza, another three, four, five years of trying to talk, to cooperate and whatever, and to sit and negotiate and then not agree. And then what? 15 years later, we're going to see this again, over and over again. It has to, we're just pushing it. We're going into the circle. We push it a few more years, few, push it a few more years, push it a few more years. Maybe this time with a huge scale operation, terminating Hamas, we're going to push it 15 more years. But then what? If we don't find a political solution to this conflict, we're going to continue to be in this conflict. This conflict needs a political solution. Who's going to do this political solution? Clearly, I mean, I want to work for it. Every Palestinian want to work for it. Every peace activist want to work for it. But it does not seem that it's going com coming from us, sadly. It doesn't seem that we enough in Israel-Palestine are enough to make this peace process. And this is where I think the role of international community, of pushing your leadership, of trying to uh, write to your MPs, to write to you know whoever, protest, try to change public opinion. This is where it's needed, because if the U.S. wants the peace process to happen tomorrow i think they can force it just the same way they can force war and make it so big and and wonderful and and blast money uh, into buying uh, arms and putting airstrikes and moving you know planes and and ships all over even a nuclear ship now we have in the middle east you can congratulate us for this now we have it in the middle east sea uh, amazing so if we can do this by war if the us can do this then it can also move the peace camp a step forward Thanks, Ahmad. Powerfully said, um, and much to contend with. Uh, I think some of the things you mentioned at the end there, I think, are really important, um, and I think it's important for people to understand and for it to be underscored. Um, I'm also very cynical, but I think, and this is a very large conversation that we don't really have time for right now. But I can't help but bringing into into the, this space. Um, that it's also not only Israelis and Palestinians, Jews and Arabs who created this problem. Um, we can look to the British, we can look to larger histories of violence and colonialism, and if anything uh, has become apparent in these last days, it's the role of the United States also um, and the U.S. weaponry that's now being um, seen in Gaza. So uh, I think it is a transnational effort that's required, um, and I think that was well put in what you were saying. Um, and what I also heard from you is that the solidarity that's needed is one that's grounded in a larger historical perspective that can see much farther beyond the seventh and address the root histories and causes of violence that can address the occupation and the structures of power that exist here. And I think that was also really important to draw out from what you were saying. Um, Isaldin, uh, I'd love to pass to you also and ask um, you to comment in any direction you feel moved to around what you see as the need for solidarity in this moment, the role of solidarity, the kinds of solidarity you think should be expressed. Um, would love to hear anything you want to share with this audience. Yeah. Uh, you know, I feel uh, solidarity is very important right now, and it is not because of Israel and Palestine. It's a matter of solidarity, people coming together for the people who does not have voice and for the voiceless. And uh, that's uh, a duty on all of us, uh, I feel, uh, as a whole word, to step in and to stand up for people when they are in need. I mean, that's our nature. They're trying to disconnect us from this, but that's our nature. But what I want to say really on a, on a, on other, uh, other scale, I feel that's what's happening in Palestine and what's happening here. Uh, first of all, it happened in other places. 
uh, United States is the best example of this. So this is something that's happened before. Uh, and also you can see it in the same technique, you know, uh, taking the land, uh, uh, and annihilating the people, kill them in the most wicked ways, uh, and then uh, say they are criminals and dangerous and uh, segregate them. But anyway, this has happened before. Uh, and I feel right now what's happening in, in this region, uh, it's uh, something that's getting scaled on the world. We are just an experiment for all these policies to see how they can deal with the new way of enslaving people and uh, turn uh, the, this word into a more cooperative word and a more into a word that you are not allowed to say anything and they don't want you to. And that's what we are moving toward, you know. We are moving, I mean, right now, there is a law, if you have anything, this law just was approved uh, in the last week, too. If you have anything, you will go for social media support or condemns Israel, you will go for one year in jail, you know. Uh, and also, we see on the international community, you know, if you boycott, you are uh, face some uh, legal issue in your own government, you know. Uh, there is American teacher who have to resign because in her contract, it's written she's not allowed to criticize Israel in any way. And she's like, what? I'm a teacher in America. What do I have to do with Israel? Why I need to sign this? So what I'm saying, they are moving toward silence more of what's our rights as a human, you know. And uh, that's experiment. What's happening over here, it is something that uh, can be scaled on many other people. That's why... We as a people need to stand up and really to look for ourselves. Enough with this, what we claim from democracy, peace, and knowledge. Because to be honest, from just the food point of view, I see people really don't know what's happening. You know, I mean, if I tell you this fact, olive oil, 20% of it, which marketed in the United States and in UK, if it's a 20% of it, olive oil, you can call the whole bottle olive oil, 100%. And this is just FDA rules and such. And what I'm trying to say over here, we don't know what we are putting in our bodies. We are not taking the time to check what we are doing from habits, from purchasing, from putting things in our body. And of course, there's some people who do, but for most of the people, we are done with default action. And these default action are bringing to us, to our humanity, to the, our word, suffering, you know, because our choices is not just politically. Our choices should be also considering humanity, animal, the land, the earth. We should appreciate this. And our habits as a worldwide community, it's show we don't care. We don't care about earth. We don't care about the earth that's give us food. We don't care about the animals that's even we eat them. We don't care about the sea. Most of it is going to be plastic. And why I'm saying all of this, I'm saying all of this because this is the bigger picture of what we are doing as a human. So do you think I expect from people to really care about Gaza right now and Palestine? Most people, they don't care about anything. And what I'm trying to say, it's time to look into our habits, to see where direct our energy, our money, our thoughts, our love, where we put it and what we are getting. We should the question our teachers, our governors, our every source of information, because it's a battle of deception. And that's what we see in the world. There is so much information. There's so much narrative. And most of it is just just like uh, lies. And uh, so it's, it's a battle of deception. And if we don't stand for what we are as a human, I don't think we can stand for anything. If we don't stand to respect ourselves, to respect our earth, to respect our neighbors, we cannot stand for anything, you know? And uh, I always say something that is so funny, how people are so passionate to go fight for their country, you know? And uh, when it has come to the political aspect, other than politics, nobody want to fight for their country, you know? So you see all these soldiers are like, Gavin, all this energy, they want to fight for my country, I feel proud and such. And most of these people, they have no problem, you know, throwing garbage uh, in on, on, on the ground, you know, not taking care of their country. 
that's they are claiming. But that's the idea they are teaching us. This politic are just filling our minds with lies and information, and we have capacity of it, but we don't even think about it sometimes what it is. Because really, if you want to fight for your country, I want to see the dedication in the politic also as much as you see your responsibility for this land for how to take care of it, how to make it a better place, and even how to farm it and let it give you what it was here for, which was given to us by God. This this land was given to us, give us a tree, give us water, give us air, and somehow we as a humanity managed to go to a supermarket, print money and give it value and pay for this vegetable and fruit and it trade it, you know? And this is by itself, it's just, so impressive uh, to see what type of society we created. And if we don't really take a look about what we are doing, I mean, we're having crisis in every sense, you know, eco, <laughs> in the earth, you know, uh, temperatures, like uh, there is so many crises. And the question is, uh, when one of them will hit? Seems uh, very soon because nobody is taking care of anything. And on top of that, they convince you politics is the way. So everybody is leaving everything, you know, and focusing on politics and the news. I've been given our money and support to our leaders and what they do. They even sell you out. So, ah, you know, I can go on and on. Just like so frustrating to see the word is uh, not really standing for value, depth, substance, you know, and everybody has so much to talk about and so much to say when we cannot, like, just address basic things. And I think this is a wake-up call uh, for me, for everyone, you know. I feel, for me, at this point, like, my whole mind is set to change, you know. Like, I say, before I used to work for me. I used to work for Palestine. I used to work for sacred cuisine. Now I work for the children of Gaza. Why? Because... I cannot take their images, what they are experiences, what they went through from my mind. You know, I cannot even like, even if the person survived, do you think he's alive? And uh, yeah, so uh, I don't know if even I answer the question. But... You answered it more. Uh, thank you. Um, you spoke to many things that are devastating to contend with, um, but congratulations also on putting things into context and relationship, um, speaking to the ways that there are global inputs and outputs to what's happening here now, um, and the ways that it's important to question the dominant assumptions and narratives that exist to question authorities when they don't uphold the sacred value of life, and um, that we need to come together, communicate with one another, and create a future together that upholds the inherent sanctity of, of all life. Um, so thank you. Uh, I'm very sorry to say that we don't have so much time uh, left where we can go on. Um, so I'm going to quickly turn to a few quick questions from participants and that were sent in the chat. I want to start with one also um, from Sheila Evans, who asked a pertinent question, of course. Uh, about if you're taking risks by being here and speaking with us today. Sheila, I'm going to unmute you. Uh, if you're still here, feel free to ask uh, yourself. Otherwise, uh, I'll read what you wrote. Are you here? Yes, I am. Um, yes, I mean, you've been saying about, you know, your phones are taken and the the terrible way that your freedoms are being imposed upon. And it came to me, gosh, we well, are taking part in, in this uh, we around the world can get a better insight into what's been happening. And I am concerned, are you not putting yourselves at risk, the both of our speakers tonight, by coming on this um, webinar? I'm, I'm concerned for your, your safety. Well, I, what I would say, you know, our safety is a uh, much better place than many other people, you know. Uh, so, 
you know, like uh, our intention is uh, to share uh, for knowledge and education. And if this is bring us any harm. I don't know what to say, you know, but like uh, many Palestinian face and many brutality right now. And uh, uh, this is can be the light of them, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Jump in, Ahmad. I, I can, yeah, I, I thought she was going to continue with something. Uh, I mean, I mean, the risk is always there. The risk is always there. Um, but, but then what? I mean, we stay silent and we, I mean, it's a human nature to, to react. It's a human nature to act, and and uh, if I, if me and Ezra are not here tonight to tell you about it, then how would you know about it? Uh, so you yeah. know we have to get this message out. At the end of the day, I hundred percent believe that I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm just describing the situation to you, and uh, and if I get in trouble for doing so, uh, then you see how terrible things have gone. If you, if we can't see it still, and if if I if anything happens to any of us after this then uh, you know exactly where we are uh, and you would know exactly who's holding us and you know why we're being held because we just did nothing wrong and we just said the truth and we described the situation to you uh, so if that is not allowed uh, good luck humanity uh, but you know i'm not gonna hold off from uh, from talking i don't go there and support uh, I, I would go and, and and support violence support uh, terrorism support we're not doing any of this here. I'm just here telling you how life has been for the last month. And and if I'm not able to do this, and we're, if we want to be scared from saying how life has been looking, uh, then we might as well close our screens and, and go sleep and not open the news and not care about humanity. Uh, yeah, anyway, I'm going to do this again, by the way. We're glad to hear it. Um, and to what both of you said and to your question, Sheila, um, it's true what both of them said, that there are others in greater danger, and it's true what they said, um, and I want to make sure to also highlight that there are risks, and people are taking risks to speak out and to call for justice, so we don't take for granted that Ahmed and Ms. Obin are here. Um, I have a question from someone that I think I'll just read, Ahmed, and this takes things in a bit of a different direction, but I thought it would be interesting and pertinent also. Um, Johannes Zeng from Germany asked, which book on the conflict flash occupation is the most sold one? Um, and I thought it'd be a good opportunity to ask you if you had any thought on that, but also if there's something you would recommend to people to read uh, right now. Uh, just just uh, five minutes ago, I sent on the chat my email, the website of the bookshop, because I thought people may be asking about this. So it's there for you to go on the website. It's for you to email me anytime you wish. Uh, you just feel free to use it, look for it, and, and take a screenshot or whatever. You can always reach to me. Uh, what we have been uh, selling recently a lot is books on Gaza. Uh, Gaza and Hamas and the Hamas ruling. Uh, what normally sells a lot in the bookshop is a book by Rashid Khalidi called The Hundred Years' War on Palestine, 1917 until 2017. The Americans in the room might love it here now because it starts with, and the Brits too, because it starts with the Balfour Declaration and it ends with the Trump uh, Declaration of Jerusalem being the capital of Israel, full stop, no mentioning of Palestinians, from, nine, 2000, from 1917 to 2017. I, I, I have read the book. I've read a lot of books in the bookshop. This is a book. I would recommend because this is a book written by a Palestinian, a very moderate academic author, a Palestinian Jerusalemite, who is actually narrating the conflict from his perspective as a Palestinian over the last uh, course of 100 years. I, don't, I was not planning to do promotions here, but this is a book I would uh, recommend on, on Palestine uh, and the history of Palestine and occupation over the last hundred years. Uh, of course, you know, there's other books that talk about the history of Palestine over 2,000 years or 3,000 years of the history of Jerusalem. We have about 1,400 books on the uh, in the bookshop, and guess what? Most of them, 95% uh, of them, are on Israel-Palestine. Uh, so I'm not going to go through all of them, but this is, if I just want to have to pick up one book, uh, that would be it. But just to be fair, I also have to recommend a book by an Israeli. An Israeli uh, called Ilan Papi have uh, written a book uh, called The Ethnic Lending of Palestine. And this is a book that actually narrates the story of the conflict from 1948 onwards, written by an Israeli 
uh, who is taking a pro-Palestinian stand in his uh, narrative of, of the, which is also another great book. But you know, I send the website here. Feel free to reach out to me personally. I'll be happy to recommend books for you. I don't want to take this on, you know. Thanks, time for the Conversation. Thank you. We'll also send people resources to the to reach the bookshop, and uh, I know you made a list of books on Gaza that I saw circulated recently or earlier today. So we'll make sure to send that out as well. Um, very last question that I'll direct to you, Isaldeen. Someone asked for, uh, unfortunately, like, we only have time for a question, but right, to learn about Sufism. Um, someone asked about the Sufi tradition in Palestine. Uh, I'm sure it's impossible to say anything meaningful about it in two sentences and two seconds that we have. But do you want to speak yes. for this moment? But yeah, actually, I have great news. I cannot answer this question, but there is a podcast and I just put the link and this I did uh, with the Chris, uh, and it's in English. It's about Sufism in Palestine. Exactly. This is a whole episode, 45 minutes. It's really beautiful uh, episode. Uh, hear it. Uh, and if you have any question, contact me. Beautiful. I'm so glad. Um, with that, unfortunately, uh, we have to close for today. Immeasurable thanks to you, Ahmed, and you, Azaldin for joining in this devastating time. And thanks to each of you here who joined from around the world as we came together to express our solidarity and hear directly from Palestinians and Israelis in this series being impacted by escalating violence. Following our conversation today, we hope you will take what you heard uh, from Ahmed and Nizaldin as a charge towards action in a moment in which we as an international community have to do everything we can to demand an immediate ceasefire. Now is the time to write to your elected officials, sign petitions, demonstrate, attend town halls, disrupt meetings, act in civil disobedience, share what you learned today with your peers, bear witness, and do all we can to amplify voices uh, like Isaldin's and Ahmad's facing imminent censure, uh, surveillance, displacement, we stand for all those calling for not reprisal, but a just and lasting peace and an end to occupation. Uh, we invite you to our upcoming episodes, sessions, conversations through Solidarity Speaks happening weekly. And our thoughts are with all of you around the world um, and especially our friends impacted by the continuing violence in Israel and Palestine. We hope everyone here has good and peaceful days. And we send all of our love and solidarity to protesters around the world calling for de-escalation and ceasefire. We will send a recording of this uh, at some point in the future. And we hope to see you all soon. Much thanks to everyone and have wonderful days. Talk soon. Yes, thank you all. I really appreciate it, Ervis, for making this happen. Thank everyone who tuned in and took the time uh, to listen to us. I... Yeah, uh, as you said, Erez, and uh, please, this is the time where we need ceasefire. Fire, so do whatever you can to ask and to let the people know ceasefire now. That's what we need. Thank you all, and uh, much love and support from Jerusalem. Assalamu alaikum. Amen. Uh, I just want to jump in very quickly too. Thank you so much again. I'll say thank you for taking the time uh, to listen to us. It's really important. And I know that, you know, this is the things that are heard here, you're not going to see and hear on the news. So I really appreciate your commitment uh, to coming here. What needs to be done is a ceasefire. What needs to be done next, as I see on the comments of the thank yous, people asking what they can do. I hear people telling me every day, messaging me from all over the world, how can we help you? We need the ceasefire. This is what we need. We need to, we, all of us, all of us, we need to work for it because it needs all of us to work for it to happen. Uh, so that what needs to happen next. Uh, first, what needs to happen next is uh, the rebuilding of Gaza and the rebuilding of because it's all destroyed. And what needs to happen also equally is the finding a solution uh, once and for for this conflict. So that the next time I come to talk to you, we talk about something more fun. Uh, so for that to happen, we have to have a solution. Uh, so that's the second on the agenda. Uh, and what needs, what also people can do from abroad is you can sponsor Gazans, you can sponsor Palestinians. You know, get in try to get in touch with them. You can uh, sponsor their education. Many schools and universities are now, you know, are matched to the ground, and there will be a lot of people after this war who will just need a place to stay and will just need a place to a, a book uh, to study from. And that's what where you can help. Please help people with their education because if we have more educated people, hopefully we will have a, letter, a better future. So this is something that you can also explore and explore in terms of how you can help. Thank you so much.
love about education you stick to your theme educational bookshop <laughs> nice ahmed education is the strongest weapon yalla assalamu alaikum to all education is very important bye bye everybody bye 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 ma salam thank you everyone